Hi everyone and welcome to this week's crime and punishment story. This week I am covering the story of Thomas Miller, John Dixon and the murder of Patrick Rogers, more commonly known as Needle Jack, in Newcastle upon Tyne in 1862. But before we begin, can I just say if you do enjoy this video, then please give it a thumbs up. And if you are new here or haven't already done so, then please do consider subscribing to the channel to help support the content we create. Thank you. This is probably one of the strangest stories I have researched so far. I hope you will find it interesting. John Dixon was said to be around 21 years old in 1862, so he would have been born in around 1841. However, his court records suggest he was actually 23. John worked as a wherry man. I hope I have pronounced that correctly. A wherry was a boat that was used to carry cargo or passengers. So in some ways, very similar to the ferries that many Northeast people will remember that passed from one side of the Tyne to the other. But of course, much smaller and more like a rowing boat. He lived with his father in what was described as an overcrowded area near to the close in Newcastle. It was said that some of these homes would have windows looking out onto the Tyne, but most would have views of nothing more than tiled roofs and chimneys, very much like the photo you can see on screen now. His parents were described as having been honest and industrious people, however, he was described as being somewhat of a loose character who was totally enslaved by his love of the drink. Thomas Miller was said to be around 22 years old at the time of the crime, so would have been born in around 1840. However, it is possible that he was also a little older, as his court records suggest he was 24. No details were given as to where he lived, but it was said that his father was a shoemaker who lived at the Tut Hill Stairs. Thomas was a glassmaker by trade, but was said to be also good at shoemaking, but had never took that up as a trade. Somewhat similar to John, he was described as being of bad character and very fond of drinking, to the point where he would sell items of his own clothing in order to buy drink. Both men were said to be known to the police and it was believed that they had both previously spent time in prison for various minor crimes. Patrick Wad Rogers, the victim, was, as said earlier, known better by the name of Needle Jack, but for the purpose of this video I will mostly refer to him as Patrick. He had acquired the name Needle Jack after spending some 14 years selling needles, pins and other small household items in the streets of Newcastle around the area of the Quayside. He could frequently be seen in the streets around the Close, Sandgate and Pipewell Gate. He was said to be around 45 years old so would have been born in around 1817. He was of no fixed abode and was unmarried, lodging with people as and when he could, and he was also very fond of the drink. And although the papers suggest he did not get into any trouble, it would seem that he did often spend time in prison for being drunk and disorderly, and it was said that his life's work was to find money to pay for his drink. But it was made clear that he was an inoffensive, quiet man, and he sadly seems to have been frequently the subject of other people's practical jokes. On the afternoon of August 16th, 1862, Patrick Rogers went into a public house ran by a man by the name of Mr. Templey. The pub was in the Quayside area of Newcastle. Patrick was already quite bad with the drink, and Mr. Templey refused to serve him and asked him to leave which he did without any fuss. On leaving, he went to a public toilet known as the High Crane Privy. This name, I believe, came from it being beside the High Crane on the quayside in Newcastle. 
At this time, there were many public toilets or privies in the area, as many public houses did not have them. They were, of course, not the nicest places, and although they would not have looked entirely like the picture on screen at the moment, the toilet part would have likely been very similar to this. A few moments after Patrick went into the privy, John and Thomas went inside as well. No one is clear on whether or not they had been with him or following him. There was another man inside at the time by the name of John Todd. John Dixon and Thomas began to speak to Patrick, asking him when he had got out of prison. He had been inside a short while for being drunk. As John Todd was preparing to leave, he saw one of the men strike a match and try to set light to Patrick's hair. Patrick, it seems, then tried to leave, but he was pushed against the privy wall and told not to move. After this, John Todd saw John and Thomas pick Patrick up and attempt to push him down one of the larger holes in the privy, feet first, while holding him by the top half of his body. On seeing this, he left as quickly as he could, and a few moments later, the two men came running out, laughing their heads off with no sign of Patrick. John Todd went back inside the privy, but Patrick was nowhere to be seen. These holes in the privy were overhanging the Tyne, and in some ways they were used for light inside, and in others for the water of the Tyne to wash away the waste from the use of the toilet. A few moments after the man, men ran out, a young boy by the name of Joseph Messenger, who was standing on the old Tyne Bridge, spotted something in the water near to where the privy hole came out into the Tyne. At first he thought it was a dog, but he quickly realised it was a man. He saw his arm in the air and then he saw him sink under the water at the base of one of the ships. He shouted for help and a crowd gathered on the old Tyne Bridge, but no sign of Patrick could be seen. The old Tyne Bridge was where the swing bridge can now be seen. It was nothing like what we know as the Tyne Bridge today, being much lower and all made of stone. Immediately after the alarm had been raised, the river police and many men in small boats set out to search for the man that had been seen in the water, but sadly they were now searching for a body as he had not been seen above the water for quite some time. The news spread quickly round the town and it was said that huge crowds gathered to stand on the old time bridge to watch the men at work. The river police and the men in the boats searched until quite late that night but eventually had to give up only to return the next day to continue their search and again crowds gathered on the bridge to watch. It was decided that the boats where Patrick had last been seen should be moved and the river police eventually found the body of poor Patrick caught in the mud where those ships had been. He was then taken to the mortuary in Newcastle, which in those days was often referred to as the Dead House. Both Thomas Miller and John Dixon had disappeared after leaving the privy, but the police were very quickly on their trail and they don't seem to have attempted to hide as they were quite easily found. John was found in the Castle Garth area and was taken to Manor's police station and Thomas Miller was found at Gateshead and also taken to Manor's police station. Both men had been caught and in custody by 4pm on the day of the crime. Both were charged with the willful murder of Patrick Rogers. Thomas is said to have made no comment to this but John, it was claimed, had said, Me? Me? as if in disbelief that he had been arrested for such a crime. The inquest was held the following Tuesday at Manor's police station. John Todd said that he was a carp man living at Clavering Place in Newcastle. He said he had been in the privy when the men had come in. He told how it had been Thomas who had pushed Patrick against the wall and also Thomas who had tried to set light to his hair. He said he had seen the men putting Patrick feet first down the privy hall but had left quickly. Afterwards, when he had seen the two men running out laughing and he could not see Patrick inside the privy, he had gone down to the Tyne to look in the water but had not seen anything. He said he knew Patrick or Needle Jack by sight and he knew it was him in the privy. John Fromson said he was in 
a cartman living at Scottswood Road, and he claimed that he had also been in the privy on the Saturday afternoon, but not in the same compartment as the other men. He said he had heard voices claiming that Patrick had said he had come out of prison the previous Thursday, and John Dixon had asked him what he had been in for, and Patrick had replied for being drunk. He said he then heard John Todd laugh. John Todd, he said, was a childhood friend, so he had recognised his laugh. He then got up and went to where the men were to see what was going on. He saw Thomas strike the match and put it to Patrick's hair, and as Patrick tried to move away, he heard Thomas tell him to stay where he was or they would kill him. He stated he had, that he had not liked to hear such talk, so had quickly left the privy. He said he then saw the two men run out laughing and he asked John Todd what they had done. He told him that they had put Patrick down the privy hole. He claimed that John Todd had not gone near the water to look for Patrick but had actually gone off in the same direction as the two other men. He himself immediately went to look in the time to see if he could see Patrick but he could not. He then heard a boy shouting about seeing a body. He said he went towards the Sand Hill area of Newcastle where he met a policeman and told him what had happened. He was asked about the privy hall and he explained that the bottom used to be flat and that people would often go down if a watch or money was lost in the past but it had recently been altered and was now a steep drop straight into the River Tyne. He was not sure whether John and Thomas would have known it had been altered. Joshua Foster, who was a river policeman, stated that he had assisted in the search for Patrick and was there when he was found. He noted that Patrick's jacket was pulled partly up over his head and he believed that this was something that had happened before he went into the water and this would have made it difficult for him to use his arms to swim. Joseph Messenger said he was 15 years old and he spoke of seeing Patrick in the water. He said he had shouted for help and that although crowds had gathered on the bridge, no one had been able to help until a short time later when the boats had been launched. He said he had seen Patrick sink down under the water beside the boats where his body had later been found. Detective Fawcett said he had arrested John Dixon on Saturday afternoon in a house near Castle Garth. He said he had had an idea John was inside the house, but after knocking and shouting with no reply, the door had been forced and John had been found lying on a bed inside. Other than sounding surprised at the charge, Detective Fawcett said John had made no other remarks. Detective Elliot said he had arrested Thomas at Gateshead. He said Thomas had at first simply said, I, then later said it was a lie. He stated that when both men were formally charged at the police station later that night, they had claimed they were never there, stating that they had never been in the High Crane Privy that afternoon. The coroner addressed the jury, stating it was for them to decide if this was murder or manslaughter, and he then gave greater detail of the definition of both. The jury retired for only a few moments before returning a verdict of guilty of willful murder against both Thomas Miller and John Dixon, and they were committed for trial. Sadly, I was not able to find any details of a funeral for Patrick Rogers, but I would have to imagine that as a man who appeared to have no family, it would have sadly been a pauper's funeral, and therefore not likely to be reported in the newspapers at the time. The trial took place in early December of 1862 at the Moot Hall in Newcastle. Both Thomas and John pleaded not guilty, and it was said that neither men seemed to be aware of the grave situation they were in with regard to the murder, and both displayed a lack of concern, sometimes even said to be grinning at the jury. John Todd gave very similar evidence to that which he had given at the inquest. However, he added that when he had left, it had not been because Thomas and John were picking on Patrick. It had been because Thomas had sat down at the toilet, still with his clothes fastened. And he said he had not run out of the toilet laughing either. And that he had heard Thomas say, don't move or I will kill you when Patrick had tried to leave the privy. 
John Fromson also gave very similar evidence, only adding that John Todd was very deaf and may not have heard all that went on in the privy that day, as he himself was certain that Thomas had said, we will kill you, not I will kill you. He also alluded to the fact that John Todd was not a very bright man, which I found somewhat odd, as I felt there was no need for him to pass this comment. Joseph Messenger, Joshua Foster, Detective Elliot and Detective Fawcett all gave the same evidence as they had done at the inquest. Orlando Osmond Ingo said he was in charge of the mortuary when the body of Patrick Rogers had been brought in. He confirmed what Joshua Foster had stated about the coat being a little over Patrick's head and that this would have restricted his movement and made it hard for him to save himself once in the water. The cause of death for Patrick Rogers was said to be drowning. Although he did have an injury to his head, it was believed that this had most likely been caused when he came into contact with the keel of the ship. I did not find any actual details of a post-mortem. Neither Thomas nor John gave evidence on their own behalf. Both men had their own individual defence lawyer. However, both said very similar things, so I have, rather than repeating things, combined the details for both men. The defence stated that this was not a case of murder. There had been no malice or any premeditation. It was made clear that there was nothing to gain from killing Patrick as he had not a farthing in the world. There had been no ill feeling between the three men, no grudges held from previous fights. In fact, they had been on good terms with only the rough practical joking from the two men with no intention to kill. It was also stated that had the privy not been altered, then Patrick Woodges would not have fallen right into the River Tyne and would still be walking around today. It was never made clear, however, if Thomas or John had been truly aware of the changes to the privy hall. On the subject of the court, it was suggested that this could have happened as the two men had tried to pull Patrick out of the hall rather than pulled up to stop him being able to escape, perhaps when they had realised he was fallen in and they were trying to save him. In the end, the defence for both men was the same, that this had been a practical joke, though perhaps somewhat brutal, that had gone very wrong and that neither men had intended to kill or had any wish to see Patrick dead. The judge, in summing up, said it was for the jury to decide if the prosecution had proven without a doubt that these two men had intended to kill Patrick with malice aforethought. If this was the case, then they must find both men guilty of murder. But if they felt this had not been proven, then they must find both men guilty of manslaughter. The jury retired for only five minutes before returning a verdict of manslaughter against both Thomas Miller and John Dixon. The judge, in sentencing both men, stated that the jury had taken a merciful view of their crime, which he did agree with. However, this was still a very serious case and that both would be sentenced to 10 years penal servitude. And it would seem that both men were sent to Australia to serve out their sentence. Thomas travelling on a ship by the name of Racehorse and John travelling on a ship by the name of Merchantman. And both must have been transported immediately after the trial as their arrival year in Australia is stated as 1862. Unfortunately, I was unable to find any further details of either man, so I do not know if they ever returned to the UK. After the tragic death of poor Patrick, a letter appeared in the papers stating that the privy had been inspected and a suggestion was made that some kind of fence should be placed around the hall to prevent anyone else from falling into it, but whether or not this was done is unknown. This is a case which baffled me to some extent. It was described on most occasions as men playing a practical joke. However, it seems more of a case of what we would now call bullying. It seems Patrick was an easy target and these two men full of drink did not seem to care how they treated him. 
Perhaps they were not aware that the Privy Hall had been altered, but whether this was true or not, it seems that in their drunken state they simply did not care. Had they been sober, they may have realised how dangerous it would be for someone to be put down the hall. And I also find the comment from the defence that they were actually trying to pull him out more than a little unbelievable. Did they deserve to be found guilty of murder? Well, I have to admit that in this case, I don't believe they did, as they do not seem to have planned it or had any hatred towards Patrick, and it is quite possible they assumed he would be able to get out and not fall into the water and drown. But it was still a terrible end for a poor, defenceless man who had never harmed a soul in his life. But what do you think? Was ten years in prison enough for the crime they committed? Do you think it was right that they were found guilty of manslaughter and not murder? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I do hope that you have found this sad and tragic story interesting and I do thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.